Yes. Uh, two questions. The Mellotron. You only get one. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No. I was okay. curious as to what uh, what software you use, what patch you use for that plugin for the Mellotron sound. For the Mellotron sound. Um, Does the Mtron uh, guitar, the electric? Guitar yeah, Mtron. Mtron is the program which e emulates Mellotrons, and the guitar plug was the one that we used. Okay, thank you. My other more general question was obviously in the in the pop uh, approach to yeah. the production and the mix. You get a lot of that compressed punchiness, but how do you deal with issues of uh, crossing that threshold to the point where it, it just starts to sound either harsh, squashed, or squashed, and in terms of metering, and you know before you know it, it's it's clipping on the master out. Well, I'll show you. No, can you? Mike, can you repeat the question so they can get it in the other room? They wanted to know. This is a question from the other room. Okay. When, re <laughs> Whoa. when recording vocals, i.e. Linda Ronstadt, did you use a Neumann pop filter and roll off the bass response of the mic to cut proximity effect, or did you want to use that bottom end frequency boost? Okay. The way I did Linda Ronstadt is the way I did James Taylor is the way I did every act I've ever done. There is no roll-offs. The nose is in the hole. Anyone that's ever worked with me, including Shani, can tell you what does that mean. She knows what nose in the hole means, right? Yeah. Inside the hole of that pop screen. Um, the thing that this pop screen does, and it, w it really worked exceptionally well with Linda Ronstadt, she had a very harsh mid-range to her voice. And if you listen to all the recordings that I did with her, it doesn't sound that way. And that's because she sang through this pop screen. So it kind of gives you the choice of, do you want to put it back in or just leave it as is? And the other thing I did with her, which I did on this track with Shani, is I added a lot of 20,000 cycles. And everybody goes, well, why? You, I mean, it's like a harmonic. Nobody's going to hear it. It does affect the air and the edge of the voice at 20,000. Because I think I had 4 dB on her vocal at 20,000. Yeah. 20, um, and I did that with Linda Ronstadt, except I used to use a Lang PEQ2 that had the 20,000 cycle frequency. And I stumbled on it totally by accident because we always had all this great outboard gear at the Sound Factory. And I, and I put it up on 20 and started turning it up. Just I don't know what possessed me to do it, but I did it. And I started going, wow, that sounds great. So from that point on, I always tried to do that. The other thing that I also used to do and I still do today is I helped Waves develop a plug-in. In, in conjunction with Aphex, called the Aphex Oral Exciter, which I helped develop that <coughs> years and years ago, totally by accident. I went to a Wings concert at the Forum, and uh, I was pretty um, taken by how amazing that McCartney's piano sounded. And I kept saying to this, the sound mixer, I go, what are you guys doing to that piano? And he says, well, it's got an Aphex on it. And I go, what? He said, well, it's called an Aphex Oral Exciter, and, and it was originally designed as a live sound reinforcement piece of gear. It was not designed for a recording studio. So he said, here's this guy, Kirk Knoppel. He designed it. Why don't you talk to him? So long story short, I met him afterwards, spent a couple hours talking to him, and I said, have you ever thought of putting this on a record? And I was getting ready to mix Linda Ronstadt's um, second album, and I said, you know, I'd love to try this. So... I, I started s doing it as a send return device and you know I'd add a little bit to the acoustic guitar, a little more to the vocal, whatever, and it had a top end to it. It added a top end to things that you couldn't get with an equalizer. And, and I proved it a hundred times because every time I put it on something, somebody would go, well that's just top end, just use the EQ. And I go, okay, you try to match this sound with any equalizer and they couldn't do it. So long story short, it, it um, took off. A lot of people fell in love with it. Um, guys in New York that I knew really well at the time used to say, that's a bunch of bullshit. They're just janking everybody's chain. There's no such thing as an Apex. So eventually they got wind that there really was. Meanwhile, 30 years later, they came to me from Waves because I'm a Waves artist and from Apex because I work with them and asked me if I would help them design the plugin, which I did. And it took two years. A lot of back and forth for, for the emulation. They actually had one of the original uh, 
Aphex oil exciters, which was a tube device, and they you know, put it back online, and that's the thing that we kept A being everything against. And in the end, I think we got very close. It, is it exactly the same? No. But it works really well, and if you ever have a vocal that just needs a little sparkle or a guitar that needs a little sparkle, just a little tiny tweak, and it really does help. Well, the 20K on input and the Aphex on mix, right? Say that again? The 20K you were adding on input when you were recording. Right? Yes. And the Aphex and mix only. Yes. Yeah, I never used the Aphex as a recording device, only mixing, because I wanted to be very selective as to how... Because it, the way it works is it's a function of phase. That's the way it works. So, you know, you could cause problems with microphones by using it at that point. Uh, we, I've lost my question there. By, I, I <laughs> ruined the opportunity by asking about the Mellotron, but I really want to know about that squashed sound. Or oh, yeah, right. So... Um, Get rid of that for a second, and, and I'll show you. Can you go back to the other track real quick? Everything that I try to do when I'm mixing a track is moderation. You know, people tend to overdo stuff, and when you, when you do, and you pile that up to 50 or 60 tracks of overdone stuff, it really starts to sound either very harsh or very squashed. So I'm kind of the guy that tickles it with stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but if you take 60 tracks that you've tickled and then you put it into a, a, a manly tube variable mu like that, I mean, I know this is an expensive piece of gear and everybody can't go out and buy it, but there are uh, plugins and emulations. Steven Slate has great ones. I mean, Waves has great ones. Uh, there's a, bi a billion of them out there right now, but the most important thing is tickle it, you know? Don't hammer it. Mm -hmm.